Amen. We find unity when we pray in agreement with one another, which is why I've called you starting on Monday. So today is day seven. I asked you, I invited you as one of your pastors to join with me in praying through the Psalms. Today is day seven of this prayer journey. Um, a couple of you have reached out to me and said that you're using uh, my Old Testament devotions book, the second one, or excuse me, Old Testament, season moment three, Old Testament devotions today, that go through the Psalms. And so what I'm going to do now, instead of reading today's Psalm, Psalm 7, I did this in my Sunday school class. In Sunday school, we prayed through the actual Psalm together before we start our class on Proverbs. And so with you, instead of praying through the Psalm with you, I'm going to I'm going to read the devotion I wrote on Psalm 7 from my devotional book that goes through all 150 psalms as some of, some of you have decided to do as part of this challenge. I know some of you did that during the New Testament challenge as well where you read my, the New Testament devotion book. So here's today's psalm, Psalm 7, and I call this devotion Cry for Justice. When David was being pursued by Cush, a Benjamite, he cried out to God for deliverance. In his request for divine vindication, he called God his refuge, his shield, and a righteous judge. David knew his enemies' accusations were false, so he had nothing to fear from God's judgment. Therefore, he petitioned God in Psalm 7, verses 3 to 5. And this is something you can pray right now. O Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have rewarded evil to my friend or have plundered him who without cause was my adversary, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let him trample my life down to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Selah. And then I went on my devotion. Was David innocent? Are you? Romans 3, verse 10 says, There is none righteous, not even one. It is, just, if, is it justice we want, or is it mercy that we need? The answer is yes. We want justice in our everyday circumstances, but we need mercy for our lives. If there's not a single person innocent, who can cry out for justice, as David does in this psalm? Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Just and, justice and mercy kiss at the cross of Calvary. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When we cry out to God for justice, he transfers the guilt of our sin onto Jesus. He took our death. When we cry out to God for mercy, he transfers the righteousness of Jesus onto us. We live in him. Jesus has atoned for sin, mercy, and propitiated God's wrath, justice, once for all. Seize the moment and pray Psalm 7, meditating upon the cross of Jesus Christ, where mercy and justice kiss. Some of you may find it helpful to have a devotional book such as this next to you while you pray through the Psalms, because I, the reason we're praying through the Psalms is not just so you can have another individual accomplishment under your belt. It's so that we can It's great to have personal goals in your individual discipleship life, such as reading the New Testament, such as praying through the Psalms. But I would argue more important than just your individual accomplishments is our corporate unity as the body of Christ. So while I want to challenge you as a coach, as a fellow player on the field, a coach athlete, if you will, so I want to challenge you to read through your New Testament as we did in the first 90 days and now pray through the Psalms, I want to also invite you as your brother, let's do it together. So if you have not yet started praying through the Psalms one a day, today is day seven, please pray Psalm 7 today. Tomorrow will be day eight. And you know what the next day after that will be. And it's easy because day seven is Psalm 7. Day eight is Psalm 8. Can't be any easier than that. Every Sunday is going to be a seven. So seven, 14, 20, uh, you know, a variable of seven. So seven, 14, 21. So if you get lost in your mind, just remember seven, 14, 21, 28. 
All right, let's get into today's message. This is all about discipleship. Okay, I am here to help you grow in your discipleship. That is the reason the church exists. We glorify God through our life of worship and our life of missions, through our life of fellowship and service. When it flows from the place of obedience and love, that Jesus teaches us in a relationship with him and one another. So some of you say, well, we're all about the mission. Yes, we are all about the mission. But if that mission is not being animated or motivated by the Spirit of God working in you through the Word of God and obedience to Jesus, you may be doing nothing more than goody tissue work for yourself. But if it's motivated by the Spirit of God to see the name of Jesus lifted up, to see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, then we know that your discipleship is bearing the good fruit of missions. A lot of people will will raise hands in worship um, because their church culture is to raise hands. Some people don't raise their hands because their church culture is not to raise hands. And they do that because they're just trying to fit in with the people around them. What I want you to have is a worship that's fueled by the Holy Spirit, that if the Spirit's telling you to lift hands, you lift hands. If the Spirit's telling you to come to to the prayer stairs and lay yourself before Him in humility to do that, if the Lord's telling you to kneel where you are to do that, if the Lord's telling you to lower your hands or sit, you do that. And it's not a social construct of a community, it's obedience to the Spirit. Because our oneness is found in our diversity of expression as well as as well as in our diversity of functionality so we're going to learn that right now because that's the message today the message today is that the church is one in christ but we need to talk about what that means and what that doesn't mean so our new sermon series is called the call to the great community as i've already told you this is a discipleship training series last series was the 10 lessons that i would have with you one-on-one if we sat in a cafe and talked these lessons that we're now doing is if okay i met with a dozen people throughout the course of the week and we did these one-on-one discipleship conversations now i'm bringing the 12 of you together and we're going to have a group conversation about what does it now mean that each of us is are walking as individual disciples of jesus now what does it mean to be the corporate body of christ and how do we be functional healthy members of that body does that make sense to you i kind of want you to see the teaching paradigm here there is an individual aspect to your walk with jesus that's personal though it's never private it's personal but it's intended to bear fruit corporately so we've talked about the individual aspects okay and now we are to talk about the corporate life together okay now what i meant by never private what i mean by that is you're not supposed to hide it underneath a bushel that doesn't mean you're not going to have private time of prayer and private time of confession of course you're going to have that Um, you don't need to come to confess to me you confess to jesus he's the great high priest okay now the big idea from last week's teaching let me review briefly was that the church is God's idea. The reason I wanted to start there is because many people believe that the church is nothing more than a social political construct, that this is yet another lodge. This is yet another social group that's doing good things in the community. That has become more of a prevalent thought the farther we've gone as a culture away from being a Judeo-Christian culture. Okay, so the, the, the newer generations don't see much of a difference between whether you go to the Elks or or the lodge or or to church okay it's just another place um, where you fit in it's they call them affinity groups this is just enough this is just where you go to be with people who are like you and think like you that's your affinity group okay my affinity group is hang gliding on sunday mornings or hiking on the appalachian trail or this that's where i gather with my people so you gather with your people i'll gather with my people and we'll let bygones be bygones that you know the reality though is that the church is not our idea it's not yet another affinity group it's god's idea okay from the scriptures we learn that the church is the body of christ because we exist for the mission of jesus to the glory of god and we know that the mission what we learned last week it's the great rescue mission Okay, that Jesus came from heaven to earth to show us the way to be right with God and then to show others his love. The church 
has always been a part of God's plan A. You are God's plan A. This is not a backup plan because, oh my goodness, Adam and Eve sinned. Oh my goodness, you did too. No, God's not surprised by any of that, all right? So he sent his son. Jesus coming has always been a part of the plan. The church exists for the mission to make God's plan A known, to make Jesus known, and that brings God glory. Okay, when we are walking in discipleship and learning what it is to follow Jesus, learning what it means to obey his commands, learning how to love and forgive other people as Christ first loved and forgave us, okay, that gives God glory. It brings God glory. Finally, as I've already shared with you, last week I invited you into the 150-day Pray the Psalms Discipleship Challenge. I want you to realize you have a purpose for belonging. Individually, you are a unique, important part of God's family. I want you to know that we have a purpose for belonging. That we can only do what we're supposed to do when your purpose nests and aligns with our purpose and we become a functional, healthy body. And I believe the only way that happens, the only way belonging happens is when we intentionally work on it. That's why we're supposed to gather. That's why we pray the Psalms together. That's why we study the New Testament together. That's why for four plus years now, you've been getting a daily phone call every day that takes you into the Word of God, that helps you understand the music we sing. Okay, I, th I think I'm approaching... Uh, we're approaching call number 1500 okay it's a lot of phone calls and it's not just two minutes of my time that's hours of time almost every day to write that devotion that's a huge commitment because the only way we have unity is if we're all realizing our identity in christ and learning what that identity means from the same source which is his word so that we can then live not homogenized lives but unified lives because I don't want you to look like me. It's already hard enough for, for there to be one of me, okay? Okay, I don't, I don't want more than one of you either, okay? Um, we need to replicate Jesus. And so that's today's big idea. The church is one in Christ, okay? The church is one in Christ, that our unity is found in Christ. And there are three scriptures I'm going to walk through today, Okay? And I want to do two things with these scriptures. One, I want to read you God's truth and application because we know that truth plus application equals transformation. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Okay, Jesus said in Matthew 7 that the wise man was the man who did what he heard. The fool was the one who heard, but then went and did what they wanted. And so when the storm of life came, the person who was wise and built their house on the, right, on the rock, which is truth plus application, their house did not fall. Okay? But the person who heard the truth, but then lived the way they wanted, they built their house on the sand. And when the storm of life came, their house crumbled. I do not want to see your life crumble. I don't want to see your marriage fail. I don't want to see you struggling in some of the most intimate places of your life. I want you to be free in Christ to live for God, which means you're free from sin. Not free to do whatever you want. You're free from the captivity and slavery to sin and all the ideologies of the powers and principalities of this world, of Satan and of the flesh, just like Eric today declared that he no longer is bound by the principalities and powers of this world, but he is now free in Christ. He has partaken of the death of Christ and he is now new in Christ. And we're all, through our baptismal vows, through God's grace, looking forward to the day that we'll join with Jesus in his resurrection. And so let's look at these three scriptures today. The first one I'm going to teach you is Romans 12, verses 4 to 5. So like I told you, three scriptures we're going to look at today. Two daily applications and one prayer burden is what I'm going to leave you with today. Romans 12, for those of you who want to know, 
verses 4 to 5 in our pew Bibles is page 1021. God's Word. Romans 12, verses 4 to 5. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. Here's my question for you. And this is the application. This is what I want you to be thinking about from this scripture. How can we demonstrate our unity within our diverse functionality? How can we demonstrate our unity within our diverse functionality? I will never be an insurance salesman like Everett Cole as a phenomenal insurance salesman, a servant to our community as an insurance salesman. He's a whole lot more than a guy who sells insurance. He is a man who drives around this town and prays for this town and is there, is there for people when they need him. He has found an expression of his ministry uh, through the Breakfast Optimist Club and has served the youth of our community in many ways, has served countless meals in our community. And I'm just picking one guy because he's just there and I got a clear path to him. That's what happens, Everett, when no one sits between you and me. Um, so come to church if you're online so that Everett, and sit between me and Everett. So I'll, and, um, but I, I will never be Everett. Um, He's been coaching me for 14 years to know when to stop so that I can make the sale. And I'm a terrible salesman. I just keep talking. Uh, he goes, a salesman has got to know when to stop talking. I was like, well, I'm not a very good salesman. I'm a teacher at heart. Uh, uh, I want you to understand what I'm trying to teach you. Uh, so I keep trying to teach you at different angles the same thing over and over again. Um, but Everett loves me and I love Everett, but we're never going to be the same guy. Our unity is not me looking like Everett or Everett looking like me or me doing what Everett does or Everett expecting me to do what he does. And that's just an illustration. That's one of the main ways we need to have our unity with a diverse functionality is I respect Everett. And I believe he listens to God. I believe he listens to the word of God. I believe he tries his best to love his wife as Christ loves the church. Karen, how's he doing, by the way? Is he doing a good job with that? pretty good yeah all right great she says great all right good you're like why is he asking that i love them and i know they won't leave the church because i'm talking to them right now some of you might um so uh i actually have had that happen before no kidding so um it's amazing so anyways that's a different conversation um uh you know how can we demonstrate our unity within our diverse functionality you may not be called to be a preacher, but what are you called to do? I mean, I can't help but to see Tim and Emily here who start a business for the purpose of seeing men in our community have a place where they can learn about Jesus and be discipled and, get, and have an honest day's labor and, and be able to learn excellence and to work hard and to learn what it means to be a part of a family and a team and to have a place for their sons to, to be closer to their dad and to learn how to work as a man. And it took a lot of sacrifice and capital investment to start a company and to leave the, 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 a little bit of the safety and security that comes from working for another business, knowing where your paycheck's gonna come from and say, we're gonna start a business and we're gonna do it so that we can disciple men and so that our sons will be able to be a part of something and they can grow up to be godly men and spend more time with their daddy. I love that. I love that. Now, I don't have an entrepreneurial bone in my body. So to me, that's like, I want to go in the back and vomit right now just thinking about doing that myself. That's scary. I, that is unbelievably scary to me to even think about doing. But he loves it. He doesn't understand why I think it's scary at all. And he thinks I just have a lack of faith. But, that's, but he loves me and he respects me and I love him and respect him. That's how it happens. Tim doesn't look down upon me you know, for the way I'm living out my faith and I'm not looking down upon him because he's doing it different than me. 
the way we have the way we demonstrate our unity within our diversity is to realize God that God has chosen you just like he's chosen me he chose me when I was an absolute wretch serving you in the U.S. Army and then he pulled me out of a church in California and dropped me in Newcastle Indiana I had to look on the map to find out where Newcastle Indiana was but he brought, I was an airborne uh, paratrooper, ranger qualified, doing all the stuff in the army, pulled me out of that and said, nope, you're going to be my leader in the church. And then he pulled me out of a beautiful situation in Sunnyvale, California, and dropped me into Newcastle, Indiana, because God chose me to be here. And we love it. We've been here. This is our 15th year. We're like, praise God. You know, 14 years and almost five months, four months and change, whatever. I'm not counting or anything. But, you know... I, I, you get the point you're chosen to be here you're chosen to hear this message God you're here because you think you know why you're here you're here because this is God's idea for you to be here and he may use the circumstance to bring you here but you're, he's brought you here to be reminded that he loves you he's chosen you and he wants you to be a part of something big and he wants your life to be wrapped around that and the way we find our unity within our diverse functionality is when we stop judging each other based upon our own, our own sense of calling. Like, I go in the prison, and I love to go in the prison. Some of you are like, that's horrifying. I don't think it's horrifying at all. I love it. I absolutely love it. Don't feel any anxiety or fear at all when those big steel doors close behind me multiple times. Love it. Now, I wouldn't want to work in this system, but I love going in as a volunteer. You know what I mean? But maybe you're called to be, you know, a guard there, and you love that. I love volunteering there. You love working there. I can't imagine working there. We've got to learn how to respect the fact that God is the one who does the choosing and that he brings us together to be fellow members of the one body in Christ. And we are individually members of one another, which means my job is to pray for you and support you and as a pastor to help equip you to be successful in what you do, which is why I do things like, hey, if you're having a hard time understanding your Psalms, then get some help. If you're having a hard, hard, hard time making it through the New Testament and you don't understand what you're reading, then get some help. It's what we're supposed to do. Use our talents and gifts to help others. Okay, let's look at the second scripture. Ephesians 4. We've already looked at a specific passage in Ephesians 4 multiple times, but today we're going to look at the beginning of Ephesians 4. This is your second scripture, your second application. Your first application is to find your specific functionality while supporting others in theirs. What is it God's called you to do? Do it. And stop looking around and try to be homogenized with what someone else is doing. Join them, because maybe you're going to learn from them. Maybe you want to support them, but don't feel like you're lesser than because you're not doing what someone else is doing. Just do what you've been called to do. That's all you're asked to do. Ephesians 4. Here's the second scripture and the challenge that goes with it. Therefore, ah, this is, by the way, page 1055 for those who are using your pew Bibles. Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 6, love this passage. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Okay, that goes along with what we just talked about, right? You walk in a manner worthy of what you've been called to do. You don't need to walk in my yoke with Jesus. You walk in your yoke with Jesus to remind you the word easy and my yoke is easy when jesus said that and matthew eleven thirty, it means the greek word is krestos it means well suited custom made it's a personal relationship you don't need to look like me i don't need to look like you there's freedom in christ to be the very best version of you to the glory of god you don't need to look like any other person except jesus then verse 2, with all humility, some of us need a little bit, a, a, a dose of this, with all humility and gentleness, I think most people in conservative Christianity need that to understand, to be gentle, 
You can be right and wrong all at the same time. You can say all the right truthful words, but do it with a heart that doesn't look like Jesus' heart. And use the wrong tone, mannerisms, facial gestures. We've got to be right with how we communicate the Word of God. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And I've already alluded to the point I want to make here. If we are truly one in Christ and we are truly fellow members of one another, where Jesus Christ is the head of and it's all his idea, and we're trying to participate in the mission of Jesus to seek and to save that which was lost and to help them learn, according to God's word, how to walk in such a way that his body, his mission is made visible to the world, to be salt and light. Then here's the big question. How should we treat one another to preserve the unity of the Spirit? How should we treat one another to preserve the unity of the Spirit. And I've already alluded. The answer is right here. We need to know who we are. I have been called by God with a purpose. He has given me the faith to believe in Jesus, and I have submitted to that faith, and I have proclaimed it publicly through my, my baptism. I am now a member of his body, a member of his church, I am now recognizing that this is not just an individual personal enterprise. This is a corporate body exercise so that we can do this together. So I'm now asking Holy Spirit of God that you would give me the lifestyle, the, the mindset, the heart attitude, the gentleness of hands, the intentionality of feet. Please crucify my tongue. Sometimes it does damage. Crucify my fingertips and my thumbs because sometimes they do damage as much as my tongue does. And help me, Lord, how to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, worthy of the calling, and help me to relate to you and to my, my fellow members of the body and to the world to whom we have been called to do so with humility. Not thinking more highly of myself, but thinking of others. And trust me, this is hard because we all default towards thinking about ourselves first. That's our sin nature. It's human. Okay, it's like gravity. Step out of the second story window, you will go splat. Start thinking, you will think about yourself. It's just the default of creation. Scientists have done research and they have found out what people's favorite word is. It's their name. How should we treat one another to preserve the unity of the Spirit so that His name becomes our favorite word? And applause for what He does through us is our greatest ambition. You have been called together to show the world the rescue mission of Jesus. Does anybody remember what Jesus said about the greatest commandment? We're to love one another as he first loved us. And how will the world know that we're his disciples? By our love for one another. And may our love be filled with truth and grace. May our love be filled with humility and gentleness. And may the truth of the gospel be made known not only by the words we say, by the way we look at people, the way we relate to people, the way we use our hands with people, the way we use our bodies, the way we show respect with our fingertips and our thumbs and with our tongues, so that everything we think, say, and do may bring glory to him because we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ministers of, of reconciliation. We're heralds of good news. We're envoys of the message. 
all the different ways we're told to look like Jesus, <laughs> which is what discipleship is all about, right? You look like Jesus. That's what discipleship is. But don't try to look like me, and I won't try to look like you. We'll all look like Jesus and be united together around his headship, and then we'll treat one another the way he first treated us with love and compassion. And that brings us to the last point and the last scripture for today, John 17. And we will conclude with this because I'm going to ask you the question up front today on this point. On the, third, on the first two points, I read the scripture, and then I asked you the application today. This point, the final point, I'm going to ask you the application up front. I'm going to be praying over you, John 17, verses 20 to 26, and then we are going to have a time of response. We're going to have a time uh, of decision but I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you as you pray through the Psalms, I'm going to ask you to also, over this course of these 150 days, I know this is a long time. You're like, 150 days, yes. I know that's like a long time, almost half a year. But as you every single day pray in unity with the congregation by praying a psalm a day, the same psalm as everyone else in the congregation is praying, I'm going to ask you to consider, this is this is big deal, to consider, if not every day, often, three to four times a week, maybe at least once a week, I want you to consider over this course of these 150 days, how do we pray for one another to see the fulfillment of John 17? Not only in our congregation, but also in the church of Henry County. As I told you two weeks ago, I will, as Pastor Ken will be preaching here next week, which has been scheduled because we have Pastor Ken preaching uh, in preparation for his sabbatical coming up, which is less than two months away. I'm so excited for you. Not as excited for me as I am for you, but I'm so excited for you. I'm rejoicing with those who rejoice. Um, and you can grieve with those who grieve. But anyways, um, so... So while Pastor Ken is preaching here, I've been invited for the first time in 14 and a half years to guest preach at one of our churches in our community. So I'm going to be just guest preaching. So it's a gift. It's a blessing um, to be able to go to South Memorial Drive Church of God in this time uh, where they're in between and they're asking for people to do some pulpit supply. And I am so blessed. And I'm going to be bringing them a kind of a summary statement of that 10-week discipleship uh, series I did. So please pray for them. I think they're used to being out before noon. I'm thinking about holding them to about one o'clock so that, you know, maybe they'll never ask me to preach there again. I don't know, but no, I'm just kidding. So, uh, but I really want them to understand discipleship. So I'm going to bring the yoke of Jesus with me. You know, I got that yoke. Thank you, Debbie. She gave me a yoke that was her fam a family heirloom, and I treasure it. It's in my office. Thank you. Such a gift. And so I, I bring that yoke when I speak, and I'm going to bring that yoke with me, and I'm going to teach them about the yoke of Jesus and the call of discipleship. I'm so excited to do that, and I've done that with you many times. So thank you for sharing me for that one Sunday, and please, uh, Pastor Ken's going to do an awesome job. The heart of a servant is going to be a great message. Um, so I'm excited about that privilege and opportunity because the body imagery is not just about our congregation. The body imagery is about the whole church. There are many different body parts, okay? And there's different expressions of Christianity, some of which you may not like or agree with. But there are some things you may not like about me or agree with. I get that, all right? But we're still finding our unity within our diverse functionality and with our person within the different congregations of our community. Because if we want the over 22,000 people who have not heard the name of Jesus and responded, maybe they've heard, but they have not yet responded to the name of Jesus in Henry County. Uh, and when they did recent research, that's how many people are not actively, you know, walking in a relationship with Jesus. Um, there are plenty others who say they are, but aren't like going to church and stuff. But so, and by the way, just, I mean, another thing came to mind, I'll, I'll close soon, um, is that you're like, ah, no, good news. We're going to get reinforcements sent to us next year. So glad tidings. They're, they're planting their fifth satellite campus here in Henry County next year. And, and so that's like awesome news because there are like 
like five figures worth of people in our, in our county alone, you know, like I said, over 20,000 who are not being touched by the church yet. And by our ministries. So what God is doing is, I see, he's grafting in another member of the body from a local regional church that says, we are overflowing with blessings, we are rich with people and resources, and we want to take that and share. And so we have a boy that was raised in this, a man who was raised in this community who's going to be coming with his wife and planning a church here next year. And that's exciting. Because when I met with a group of pastors this week, one of those pastors is, is already meeting with that uh, new pastor who's going to become our community. And we don't need to see that as a threat or as a competition for limited resources. We need to see that as God multiplying our work and grafting into the body a needed part so that we can reach more people for Jesus. And that's an illustration of how we need to look at each other. There's no competition of resources here. When we all share what we have and we serve the same mission, then we're in it together. And we can do more together than we can do apart. So here's the final thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to pray. And as I pray through this, I'll have Emily and Matthew come up. We are one in Christ. And how do we pray for one another to see the fulfillment of John 17? which I'm going to pray for you now. John, I'm just going to do seven verses. John 17, 20 to 26. I'm not going to do the whole chapter. That's another expression of my love for you. But I encourage you each week, if not each day, to pray John 17 over First Baptist Church, over the Church of Henry County, and over the Universal Church throughout the world. That we would be one in Christ according to John 17. So let us pray. John 17, this is found on page 972 of your pew Bible, if you want to read along as I pray. Verses 20 to 26. Jesus' words, praying to the Father, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying for the church here. He's praying for disciples of Jesus. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they, my body, may be one, just as we, Father, are one. I and them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, Although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Wow. Jesus, thank you that we are the them of this prayer that we are your body, we are the ones that you were directing this prayer to as you talk to your Father. Thank you for the beautiful, miraculous prayer that is the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ found in John 17. May we pray this weekly as we learn to pray Jesus' prayer book, the Psalter, the book of Psalms daily. And may we be found unified in the Spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit as we pray in agreement with your word and that we each find our functionality, that we each find what it means to be a functional member of the body so that we may have unity within our diverse functionality and may we love one another as Jesus first loved us with gentleness and humility so that an unbelieving world may look upon the church and say, wow, 
heard a lot of bad thing about these people, but these guys really look like love. What's going on there? We thank you, Lord, for our sister and brother and cousin churches throughout the community and throughout the state. We pray for the unity of your body amidst denominations and some distinctive differences. But we pray, Lord, that we will not disunify over our distinctives, but we will unify in Christ Jesus crucified, risen, and coming again. Once again, that requires humility and gentleness. Help us to realize, Lord, we can do more together than we can do apart. So may the spirit of John 17, the same Holy Spirit that works in the power of the resurrection, be at work in us so that beauty may come from these ashes that is the American church. Lord, we pray and ask that you would raise up something beautiful out of our fellowship and out of the fellowship of your church, not only in our nation, but in the nations. In Jesus' name, we all pray, and God's people said, amen.